Thanks for turning me in the rain. I know it's kind of a bummer. I don't have control over it. Who would have thought, right? Um, my name is Brianne. I'm one of the interpreters here at the Vancouver Aquarium. I'll be talking to you all, all today about these amazing marine mammals here, uh, this very handsome boy behind me. Uh, but before I get started, I would like to take a moment to acknowledge that currently all of us are gathered on the unceded ancestral territories of the Musqueam, Squamish, and Tsleil-Waututh nations. These are the indigenous peoples of this region who have been caring for these lands, waters, and animals since time out of mind. And we truly thank them for this stewardship. Today we're learning about one of the amazing marine mammals that lives right along our coast here in British Columbia. Uh, this is a stellar sea lion. His name is Kenai, and these are the largest sea lions in the world. Uh, we're actually going to get a weigh session here this morning from Kenai. That scale is in kilograms, just so everybody is on the same page here. Uh, so 712 kilograms translates to roughly 1,600 pounds if we have any Americans in our audience today. So that is a big, big boy. Uh, and uh, this is a great example of one of the reasons that we train. Today we're going to be talking about why we train the animals here in the aquarium. We're going to be learning about how that training actually happens. And we're going to see that the relationship that people like my friend Nigel here are building with the animals that they take care of is truly the foundation for all the work that we're able to do here at the Vancouver Aquarium. So can we start it off by giving Nigel and Kia a big round of applause, everybody? Yes. Oh, guys, right on. Thank you, everybody. So, three reasons why we train the animals here at the aquarium. And keep in mind, this is a sea lion training session this morning. Training is happening with all of the animals that are under our care. So, the tortoise is inside, they get trained. The octopus that lives inside, he gets training. Uh, we do training with the birds. Uh, even some of the fish get training. So, training happens with all the animals here for the most part. And there's three reasons why. The first reason we already saw a good example of here this morning, that's going to be for healthcare. Uh, so, healthcare involves training for behaviors called husbandry checks. We actually do these. When you go to a doctor, when you go to a dentist, you can probably think of some things that they might ask you every time that you go there, right? I always think about how they ask me to open up my mouth and say, ah, right? That makes me feel a little silly. Uh, but it's so they can look at your teeth and your gums and your mouth to make sure that things are looking nice and healthy, right? You'll actually see Nigel ask Kenai to open up his mouth. This behavior right here, we're doing a nice check to make sure that his body is looking nice and healthy, that he doesn't have any, you know, weird cuts or scrapes or anything like that, no lumps, no bumps, and making sure that we practice these behaviors regularly is really important in case Kenai or any of the other animals here at the aquarium need to go to the vet for a checkup, right? Uh, these animals get routine vaccinations, uh, sometimes we do blood work to make sure that everything's working the way it's supposed to be. Uh, we sometimes do x-rays or ultrasounds with the animals, so we want to make sure that they're comfortable doing all of these different behaviors so that when we take them to the vet, they already know what's up, they're already comfortable with it, they're ready to go. So healthcare is definitely the most important reason that we do these training sessions, because we want to make sure that the animals are as healthy as we possibly can make them, right? Now, what contributes to good health? How do we make sure an animal health too, right? And that does apply to animals as well. Sea lions are really intelligent animals. They have to solve problems in the ocean all the time, right? How will they outrun that orca? How will they catch their food? How are they going to navigate bad weather, right? All of these things are things that are keeping their minds really active. So in these sessions, we're also making sure that their minds are playing a big part of the training and not just their bodies, right? So even just learning these different behaviors is a really good example of mental enrichment, that their minds are staying nice and active. Um, it can also look like having them interact with something new in their environment. I think recently, <laughs> They've been trying to get Kenai comfortable with getting up onto this dock here. Uh, so that's one thing that they've been working on as well. Um, and a good example too is two behaviors at the same time. I'm going to test you guys here. I'm going to see how active your guys' minds are. Can anybody here pat their head and rub their belly at the same time? Yeah? Oh, good. So everybody's just good at that. All right. Well, yeah, it took me a while to practice. Uh, and we have examples of that for sea lions as well too. See, so he's getting more comfortable with it, right? This is his keeping his mind active. You might also see he and I do a behavior uh, that's similar to patting his head and rubbing his belly, swimming alongside and flapping his slipper at the same time. This is using different parts of his brain simultaneously, so his mind is staying active, his body 
body is staying active, and ultimately that contributes to really good animal health care, right? Now that we know a little bit about why we're doing what we're seeing here today, we can talk about <laughs> uh, how it works. How is Nigel communicating with Kenai right now and asking for these different behaviors? It's nice to think that maybe we speak the same language, uh, but as you can see, clearly that's not exactly the case. We communicate with the animals here with a method of training known as positive reinforcement. Have any of us used positive reinforcement before? Yeah? If you're a parent, right, you definitely use positive reinforcement. It also works on your siblings, it works on friends, it works on dates, it works on coworkers. Positive reinforcement is very, very helpful for figuring out how to communicate with not only animals, but the people in your life. So let's break it down. Let's learn how Nigel is training right now, okay? The first step is ask, okay? We can't expect anybody, whether it's a human or an animal, to do anything if we don't ask first. We don't speak the same language, so we use hand signals to communicate with the animals. So whether it's to roar, right, or to haul out of the water, or to open up their mouths, every hand signal is linked to a different behavior. <laughs> The second step is going to be a bridge. So at the peak of the behavior that Nigel is asked, you're going to hear him yell, good. It can be any sound. Uh, I know when I trained my dog, I used a clicker. That works as well, too. Uh, but when Kina is at the highest point out of the water, you're going to hear Nigel yell, good. And that is that bridge. That lets Kina know that the third step of the reward is coming in. And of course, who can shout out what a good reward for a sea lion? Hey, she got it, friends, and it's a lot of fish. He's eating a lot of herring, capelin, and squid. Right now, that's about 38 kilos of fish he's eating a day. That is more than most of you children probably weigh, I would venture to say. Yes. So he is eating a lot of fish every day. And the most important thing in these training sessions is that if Kenai doesn't want to do a behavior that Nigel has asked of him, like we were seeing with this dog here, he was trying, but he was you know, kind of hesitant, right? That's a new thing. It was a little bit, you know, maybe nerve-wracking at first. He doesn't have to. He's still offered the same amount of food no matter what. If he doesn't want to participate in the training at all that day, totally all good. He's still getting all 38 kilos of fish if he wants it, of course, right? And all of this training, all this relationship building is super cool. Uh, we are actually leading researchers in stellar sea lions here at the uh, with the University of British Columbia. I don't know if you guys knew that when you walked in today, but leading researchers on these marine mammals. And we've learned a lot. We've learned a lot about their social behaviors, how they interact with one another. We learn a lot about their metabolism and their diet, you know, how much energy do they need to live their lifestyle. We learn a lot about how they're able to dive and hold their breath for a really long time, like nine minutes. Uh, we learn a lot about these animals. And all this research is really important. Research for research's sake is cool, but right now, stellar sea lions have been facing a crisis in our oceans, unfortunately. We've been working overtime to figure out what's going on, because since the 1980s, so in the last 40 years, about 80% of stellar sea lions have disappeared from our oceans. Yeah, 80% of those animals are gone. And we don't really, we didn't really know why. But we've got a pretty good hypothesis now. But in order to get that hypothesis to figure out what's causing so much stress to Kenai and his ocean counterparts, uh, somebody had to have a really gross job, quite frankly, a really gross job. Because we had to study the diets of sea lions in the ocean. It's really hard to see what they're catching when they're in the ocean, so instead somebody had to look at what came out of their body after they ate. Yeah, this guy knows, yeah. Scat collection. <laughs> Does anybody know what scat is? Can you show us what scat is to me, please? No, oh, exactly. Somebody had to go out and collect piles of sea lion poop along our coastline, uh, rinse off the gross poop, and then look at the fish bones inside of it. And this is how we figure out what they're eating. What we want to see is salmon and herring, right? High calorie, high fat fish, because that's what they need to get to this size to live that lifestyle. However, what we've started to see <laughs> is not seagulls, uh, but we have started to see walleye pollock and atka mackerel in their poop, okay? And that is bad news. That is like the popcorn of fish. <laughs> Here it comes. <laughs> Fish. Acomacrol and walleye pollock does not give these 
animals enough calories to live the lifestyle that they do. Now, sea lions are humans. They don't wake up one day and decide to cut out fat out of their diet, right? They want to eat salmon, they want to eat herring. The issue is they can't find it in the ocean. There's a lot less salmon and herring around nowadays because there's another animal that's taking all the salmon out of the ocean. Oh, beautiful, and there's a heron in the tree. Totally off topic, but you gotta point it out when you see it, right? Does anybody know what animal is eating all of the salmon out of the ocean? I'll give you a hint, it's not sea lions, it's not herons, but I am looking at a lot of them right now. Humans, friends, you got it. Humans are taking all the salmon. We're not leaving enough behind to share with the other animals. That's actually really good news though, because we know what the problem is, so we can be a part of the solution as well. I'm gonna give you guys three things to keep in your back pocket of ways that you can help out sea lions here today, okay? The first thing that we can do is that if you do choose to eat fish, <laughs> to know where your fish is coming from. For myself, I like to look for like an ocean-wise symbol or a marine stewardship council symbol at grocery stores and restaurants to make sure that I know my fish was harvested sustainably. But I know that that's an expensive option. We can also look at reducing the amount of seafood that we eat or opting for lower fat fish in our own diet so that we're sharing more of the high fat fish in the ocean for sea lions and other salmon eating animals. Another thing that we can do is something you guys have actually all done here today. By coming out to the aquarium, you have learned about the issues the animals are facing. You're gonna go on and tell the people in your life what you learned here today, and you're supporting the work that we do when it comes to learning about these animals. So education is a great first step. You've already all done it today, so you can cross it off your list, and you can pat yourselves on your, on your backs for the hard work that you've done already. The last thing you can do is the most important thing, okay? Did you guys all know that you have a voice and it's actually really impactful? That we can use our voices, especially when we add them together, to advocate for the change that we want to see in the world. In my lifetime, kids, like many of you guys I'm looking at here today, have actually changed the course of history because they took their voices and advocated for the environment, for animals, and for the issues that these animals are facing. So please use your voice to talk to the people in charge and tell them that you care about having a healthy ocean for generations to experience so that in 40 years, I can still be working here talking about sea lions and not what sea lions used to look like, right? We can all use our voice to advocate for the greater good. Whether it's uh, the work that we do here with sea lions or the work that we do inside with all the other animals, none of this would be possible if it wasn't for the amazing animal care staff who work here. Uh, can we give Nigel and all the other amazing people here a big round of applause? today guys if you have any questions i'm gonna hang around for 15 minutes my name is brianne our next program of the day is going to be at 11 30 we'll be feeding the sea otters just behind this cafe here at the sea otter habitat uh, thank you so much enjoy the rest of your day here thank you thank you thank you